ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام والسنة حدثني جماعة من الشيوخ بإسناد كل إلى سفيان بن عيينة عن عمرو بن دينار عن أبي قابوس عن عبد الله بن عمرو بن عاص رضي الله تعالى عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الارض يرحمكم من في السماء the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said in a tremendous hadith this hadith that is مسلسل بالاولية this is a hadith that many of the imams of hadith they will teach their students this hadith as the first hadith they will teach them the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that those who are merciful, they will be shown mercy by the most merciful. Be merciful and show mercy to those who are in the earth, and the one who is above the heavens, he will show you mercy. The ulama they mention from them, Qala Shaykh Salih, Abdul Aziz Al Shaykh, Hafidhullahu Ta'ala, Thalika bi anil ilm, Rahma, Natijatuhu Rahma, Fid Dunya, Wagayatuhu Rahma, Fil Akhira. He mentions, he says, this is because knowledge is mercy. The result of knowledge is mercy here in this world. And the ultimate goal of knowledge is mercy in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who benefit from their knowledge. To make us of those who their knowledge is a mercy for them and it results in mercy in this world. And those who will receive mercy in the hereafter due to them implementing their knowledge. Allahumma anfa'na bima allamtana wa alimna ma yanfa'na wa zidna ilma. We're continuing going over this tremendous hanith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have reached the portion of the hanith, the last and final portion of the hanith. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said Kullu al-Muslim ala al-Muslim haram That all of the Muslim upon the Muslim is haram Damuhu wa maluhu wa irduh His blood His wealth And his honor, his reputation All of that is haram Wa qala al-alama Muhaddith al-Madinah the great scholar, the muhaddith of al Madina, al Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al Abad, Taala, he mentions, he says, يحرم الاعتداء على النفس بالقتل وما دونه that. It is prohibited to infringe upon an individual. It's prohibited to infringe upon others. Whether that be with killing, 
with murder or what is less than that, that we cannot infringe upon others. We cannot cause harm to others, whether that is the ultimate harm in killing them or anything that is less than actually murdering them. All of this is haram. This is haram. Al-i'tida al mal bisariqa wal ghasb wa ghayri dhalika to infringe upon an individual's wealth whether that be by stealing from them or whether that be by robbing them or other than that all of that is haram so if a person steals from another this is haram to steal to rob an individual is haram to rob and other than that so for example other than that to extort a person is haram to cheat a person out of their wealth to swindle them all of this is haram it is prohibited it is prohibited in the deen of al-islam it is prohibited and also to infringe upon the reputation and the honor of individuals this is haram the shaykh he mentions he says بسب والشتم والغيبة والنميمة وغير ذلك to infringe upon the rights of someone else whether that be by verbal abuse by cursing them by saying hurtful and scornful things to them by verbally abusing them by backbiting them by slandering them inventing tales against them lying upon them so on and so forth and other than that all of this is haram we're not allowed to do this we're not allowed to slander people. We're not allowed to backbite people. We're not allowed to yani, make up lies and tales about people. We're not allowed to verbally abuse people. We're not allowed to cuss and curse at people and so on and so forth. These things are haram. And I want you to reflect upon this. These things are haram. And I'm stressing this is because it has become very easy, especially in the time of social media, to troll individuals and a lot of times when individuals are being trolled what they are doing or what is happening to them is some sort of verbal abuse is some sort of abusive language is some sort of abusive speech so it is incumbent that we understand that we are not allowed to embark upon the likes of these things especially when it comes to the muslim as the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said Muslim Muslim Haram. All of the Muslim is haram upon the Muslim. Naam. All of the Muslim is haram. We're not allowed to infringe upon a person's dem, upon their health and well being, upon their life. We're not allowed to hit people, to slap people, to punch people, so on and so forth. We're not allowed to do these things. Haram. Wakadalika Malu and his wealth. It's haram. We're not allowed to steal from people. We're not allowed to rob them. We're not allowed to take their money without right. We're not allowed to damage their property. We're not allowed to seize and take their property. These things are haram. Now, as we understand that these things are haram, then likewise, verbal abuse and slander of a Muslim is haram. We're not allowed to verbally abuse them. We're not allowed to Yani, speak to them in disrespectful terms and manner and ways. We're not allowed to lie on them and so on and so forth. These things are haram. People look at it like, okay, I won't I won't slap him or punch him or or, or take his money or kill him or something like this, you know, because these things I, I can clearly see I shouldn't be doing these things. But for me to say something disrespectful to this individual, for me to dis verbally disrespect this individual, for me to yani, write some uh, hurtful things about this person and so on and so forth, eh, they don't even think about it. Yeah, subhanAllah. Just like killing him is haram, just like murdering him is haram, it's haram to verbally abuse an individual. It's haram to slander people. It's haram to backbite, so on and so forth. Ala kulli hal. These things, they, all of them, they are haram. And I want everybody to really look at what is mentioned here in this hadith. And I want them to examine their behavior. Because we have to become a people who we excel in the manner in, way, in which that we interact with one another. That we are individuals who excel in our treatment of others. 
This is extremely important that we excel in the manner in which we treat other human beings. Because in doing this, there are a lot of benefits. One of the benefits, the first benefit is that we will be obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will be obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, in this regard. That's the first thing. That we will be obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will be obeying the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next is that by doing this, we will be extending good treatment to others. We will be extending good treatment to others. And that within itself is a good deed. To extend good treatment to others. Because the extending of good treatment to others will bring joy to others. And bringing joy to a Muslim, this is a good deed. Naam. We will be repelling harm from others. Naam. We, by, by us governing ourselves. And by us controlling ourselves. We will be repelling harm from others. Meaning the harm that will come from ourselves, we will be repelling it so it doesn't reach others. We will be withholding the harm from reaching other people. We're holding our harm from reaching other people. And that's a good deed. So you, you'll be, you will benefit from that. And also, it is an excellent da'wah. It is an excellent da'wah to the non-Muslims to show them the superiority of Islam. And look how when Islam is applied, how it beautifies the behavior of an individual. How it beautifies the manner in which an individual deals with other people. How it beautifies the manner in which an individual speaks to other people. This is a tremendous da'wah. This is a tremendous da'wah to the non-Muslims. So this all of these things we have to take into consideration that when we do what we are commanded to do, there is linked to that one good, many, 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 many good things of which some we can perceive and some we don't even perceive. But the good results and the good consequences or ramifications and, and, and that which will result from good deeds is good upon good upon good upon good upon good. And likewise, the opposite is also true. That when we do evil deeds, they have evil and bad ramifications and repercussions and some we could perceive and some we may not even perceive but it is bad that will be linked to bad that will be linked to bad now and just reflect upon the aforementioned example of some of the benefits we get when we implement the likes of these things now think if we did the opposite and we did not implement them and we went against them and we infringed upon them and we acted sinfully Think about the opposite of what was accomplished by doing good. The opposite will be accomplished by not doing this good and by committing this evil. The opposite of what was aforementioned. That within itself should be enough to make the Muslims stop and to reflect and to reconsider and to adjust and to adjust if adjustment is needed. على كل حال the Sheikh goes on and he says وقد أكد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم تحريم هذه الثلاثة في الحجة الوداع and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he emphasized the prohibition of infringing upon these three affairs in the farewell pilgrimage قارنا حرمتها بحرمت الزمان والمكان and that was by linking the prohibition of, in, or, or, yani of, of, of the infringement upon these three things by linking them to the sacred, the sacredness of the time and of the place. Now, because the Muslim is one who is sacred. I want, and I really want you to understand and, and to remember this. Now, that when you're dealing with the Muslims, when you are dealing with your Muslim brothers and sisters, your Muslim brothers and sisters, they are sacred. I'm, and I, I just want that to, I just want that to really sink in. When you're interacting with a Muslim, I need you to understand that you are interacting with someone who is sacred. Their physical well-being is sacred. It's not to be infringed upon. It's not to be violated. Their wealth is sacred. 
is not to be infringed upon, is not to be violated. Their reputation and honor is sacred, is not to be infringed upon, is not to be violated. This is why if we're in the masjid, for example, and a brother forgot his phone, he forgot his phone and is leaning against the wall, or it's on the masjid floor where he was sitting, no one is going to see that as an opportunity to get a new phone because he knows that this phone is owned by someone who's sacred. This phone is the property and the wealth of my brother. My brother is sacred. I cannot infringe upon his wealth. That's sacred. It's off limits. I can't touch it. And that's the reality. When it comes to these three things that I mentioned, they are sacred. They are untouchable. We are not allowed to touch them unless we have, unless we have a religious exemption, unless there is a religious exemption that allows us now to do something to them that will ill affect their health, meaning their life, their wealth, or their, or, 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 or linked to having to say some things about them that they may not like. So in the example of the first one, if a person kills people, he's a murderer. He's a Muslim, but he's a murderer. In that instance, then the Muslim ruler, he has an exemption where he could now physically punish this person and even put this person, what, the ultimate punishment, execute this person. Why? Due to that person infringing upon others and murdering others, now there's an exemption against their life. So now their life could be taken because of this corruption that they're spreading amongst the, the, uh, the community and, and amongst the society. If a person, for example, withholds giving zakat, they withhold the right of the poor. They don't want to give the poor their rights. They withhold their rights from them. Then the Muslim ruler has an exemption as relates to that person's wealth. Now, the Muslim ruler, they could garnish that person's wages or physically take or forcefully take the wealth that is owed to the poor away from that person. There's an exemption. Why? Due to the individual violating. Likewise, as it relates to saying something about an individual that they won't like, if an individual commits acts of heresy, or acts of innovation, so on and so forth, then we are allowed to speak about that person to warn people against their innovation. And when I mean speak about that person, speak about that person with those things that are connected to their mistake and or innovation. So if they made an innovation in the religion, they brought bid'ah, then we can speak about the individual in manners that they may not like to clarify that the innovation that they are upon is evil and to clarify that that individual is a carrier of this evil innovation and to warn the people from this particular individual now they may not like that but because they have infringed upon the dean because they have violated they have violated by doing this innovation then now their reputation could be violated in the sense of and in connected to the innovation that they are doing and i and i want to stress that if an individual is committing innovation, then when we refute that individual is because and due to that innovation and connected and related to it. And we don't go into other areas. We don't get into other things. We don't start now disrespecting the person about how they look or disrespecting the person about this or that. No, no, we don't we don't we don't get into that. We don't start now, you know, uh, uh, becomes open season now. So we start attacking that person's family and attacking their loved ones and that. No, we don't do that. We keep it. We keep keep it scholastic. We keep it religious. We keep it on the topic that has yani, uh, uh, removed the sanctity from this person in this in this particular regard. Okay, but we don't go into this verbal disrespect and name calling and all that type of stuff. When I mean name calling, I mean belligerent name calling. I'm not talking about stating a matter of fact. So, if a person, for example, is ignorant, then you can say about the person that they are ignorant, jahil. 
if the ignorance is compounded you can say this is a jahil jahiluhu muturakkib yani a murakkib huh? you can say this person is 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 ignorant and his and his jahil is murakkib huh? is compounded if the person is uh, unintelligent then you can say the person is ahmaq he's unintelligent the things that they're saying are so absurd and so ridiculous that this is an indication of a lack of intellectual capacity right things of this nature this is this is what is meant right this thing this nature you can you can mention these things but as far as just verbal you know disrespect and and, and abuse and saying abusive and uh, uh things and hurtful things about an individual and so on and so forth then no we cannot speak about people uh in this manner even when refuting them even when refuting them right so i want that to be known and to be understood if the person's evil then you'll find some of the ulama from the past they will mention it that an evil person like this and they will say this person is like a dajjal meaning this person is a is an he's an extreme liar and fabricator he's an extreme person of, of lies and so on and so forth so as to show the extent of the of the evil of an individual okay but anything that goes beyond that that is layam bari that is not necessary then we don't get into the likes of these things and even in those examples these are you know, the extreme examples and that meaning that these are at you know the most of what you know you you would want to say about a person yeah this person's like a dajjal and so on and so forth now I'm, this is at one spectrum but that is only utilized when it's needed that's not your that's not your first go-to you say that when the situation has reached such a critical point that that has to be mentioned that this person is like a dajjal now I'm, but anything shy of that you say what you say what is needed to be said so that what was it so that what is intended is conveyed that's it you don't need to go beyond that you don't need to go beyond that. Naam. Ala kulli hal. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he linked the sanctity of these three of these three things. The 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 the, the health or the or, the or the the life, the wealth, and the honor. They're, they're, they're sacred. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, just like the sacred time that we are in and the sacred place that we are in. And this was during the farewell uh, pilgrimage, Naam, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, "Inna wa wa a'radakum." He said, "Verily, your blood, meaning your physical well-being, your life, Naam, our physical well-beings, our lives, they are sacred. Our wealth, amwalakum, your wealth is sacred." And your honor, your, your reputations, they are sacred. How sacred are they? Yani, they are sacred. They are sacred. And you're not supposed to infringe. They are sacred and they are off limits. You're not supposed to touch them. You're not supposed to violate them. You're not supposed to violate a person's health or well-being, their life, not their wealth, and not their reputation, not their honor. You cannot violate it. It is sacred, untouchable. How untouchable, how sacred? What's the what's the level or what's the degree of sanctity of these three aforementioned things for every Muslim? It's like what? It is sacred like the sanctity of this day in this month. In this land, because this was doing what the farewell pilgrimage. Naam, Dhul Hijjah is one of the sacred months. Naam, Mecca is sacred. Mecca is sacred. Muharram. Naam, is sacred. Wait. Right. So, I want you to reflect now. On the sanctity of the time and the place. And I want you to reflect that the Prophet وسلم, he compared the sanctity of the Muslim to the to the sanctity of the time and of the place of Hajj and of Mecca. And of the, yani, the month 
the day, everything, right? Sacred, sacred. So I want you to now reflect upon this. The sanctity of that time and of that day and of that place. And now the Muslim, his sanctity is like that. So this should make us pause, hesitate and stop when it comes to violating any one of these three things as it relates to the Muslim. Again, their lives, physical well-being, people may people may see that. But I want you to but I, but I still want you to remember this. Especially the brothers. Especially the brothers. Especially the brothers who have anger management issues. I want you to remember this. Your wife that Muslim woman, she is sacred. She is sacred. You are not to put your hands on her without right. She's sacred. She's not yours to just do what you want to do with. No. Inna lillah. Inna lillah. Inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong unto Allah. And unto Allah we are returning. So she's not, that woman is not your property. That woman is the female slave of Allah. That's Amatullah. You see? She belongs to Allah. So you have to treat her in the manner in which Allah Ta'ala commanded you to treat her. Likewise for the sisters. You have some disrespectful sisters who have some anger management issues. We're not in that time frame that you can just do anything. And a man's not supposed to respond because a woman has this understanding. I can do what I want, and you being a man, you're supposed to just sit there and take it. And also, the man, he has to, just because she violated, don't mean you violate. But the point is, is that this type of mentality has to stop. You can't have this and bring this to your marriage, and then now when your husband says something, you just want to slap him in his face because you think you have it like that. You don't have it like that. No, you do not. Striking in the face is haram. You're striking a person who the Prophet Sallallahu said, if I were to command anyone to, com to to prostrate to any created thing, then I would have commanded the woman, the wife, to prostrate to her husband. You're striking a man who's sacred, a Muslim man, he's sacred. You can't just be hitting him like that just because. Just because you feel, just because you have an emotional moment. No. Have to have to govern yourself. That man don't belong to you. That man belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to treat him in the manner that Allah told you to treat him. You understand? Because the Muslims are sacred. Period. And I want to keep stressing that. So you don't infringe upon the Muslims. Adequately. Adequately. The Shaykh goes on to mention some benefits that we gain from this hadith in closing out he mentions he says this hadith one it points us to a tahrim tahasut with tanajus it prohibits having enmity or jealousy and envy now it prohibits his envy. We're not to be envious of one another. Nor are we to artificially play with the prices. Now, we are not to artificially play with the prices and interfere with people's financial transactions. We cannot play these games when it comes to the wealth of the Muslim. Because remember, the Muslim, what? Their wealth is haram. We can't, we can't play around with that. Right, so we can't artificially inflate prices to get people to pay more, now, and we cannot buy upon the purchase of our brother. Meaning, we cannot undercut each other in financial transactions. Now, we cannot undercut our brother and uh, uh, undermine them when it comes to financial transactions and to you know, push them out of a, a deal that they were going into, or so on and so forth. All of these things are haram because they are linked to infringing upon one of the three things that were mentioned. وَكَذَلِكَ الشِّرَاءَ عَلَى شِرَائِهِ And we cannot 
yani buy over his purchase. In other words, if they have, for an example, have agreed to buy something for a particular price and it's already agreed and it's settled upon, we cannot come in at the last moment and say, you know what? I'll give you five dollars more. Let me let me get it. No, that's not that's 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 not what brothers do to one another. وَكَذَلِكَ كُلُّ مَا يَجْلِبُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ بَيْنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And likewise, see these these things here, they're just, they're just examples. It's not any restricted. But these are examples. These things are off limits. And likewise, anything. I want, you, I want you to pay attention now. Anything that will cause hatred and enmity amongst the Muslims is haram. Anything. That will cause hatred and enmity between the Muslims is haram. And one reflects on these things that were mentioned, yani being envious, jealous, right? Uh, 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 artificially inflating the prices so someone so you're forcing someone to pay more, right? Um, buying over a person or, or messing with their financial transactions, under under undercutting them, and, and so on and so forth. All of these things will cause problems between the two people. The person who came in and he artificially inflated the price upon a brother. Now the brother or the individual who that, that price was artificially inflated upon. He's going to have a problem with the person that did that. He's going to have a problem with the man that, that came with that scheme. And swindle him like that. Right? People buying it over another one's buy or undercutting them when it comes to uh, uh, financial transactions. The person who was undercut is going to have a problem with the person now. Who undercut him? He's going to have a problem with the person now who interfered with his financial transactions, so that he came up with a loss, or he was you know, he he wasn't able to do what he needed to do. You're going to have a problem with that person. It's going to cause hatred. It's going to cause enmity between you and between that individual. So everything that will cause enmity between the Muslims is haram. The second thing, the second point of benefit, النحي عن التعاطي أسباب البغضاء كذلك كل ما يترتب على ذلك من تقاطع وتهاجر بين المسلمين is that also we see from this hadith that we have to stay away from all of those things that will lead to enmity and all of the evil ramifications and actions that result from enmity. They're all haram. So the things that will lead up to enmity is haram. And, 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 and the things that result from enmity, likewise, they are haram. What are some things that result from people having a problem with each other? From peeping, people having issues with each other? From people yani, not liking each other? Is that what? Is that they will abandon each other and they will boycott each other. So these things are what? Haram. So typically, boycotting the Muslim is is haram it's haram that is not our first line of uh of action it's not our first first course of action it's just the boycott no it's haram to boycott the muslims there only comes exceptions when you have what religious exceptions right when you have an exception due to the religion then you can do it and anything shy of that then no so for example the innovator could be boycotted the innovator could be boycotted now, due to the innovation. However, it is with conditions, meaning that you the the sole reason for boycotting the innovator is to draw to their attention the severity of the innovation that they are upon, and thus by this course of action hope that it will make them reconsider and retract and come back to the sunnah now this is the purpose to try to bring about a greater good or try to bring about good so we employ this tough love for lack of a better term to bring about good to make them realize okay i can't you know i need to stop what i'm doing also to save individuals who may be weak from falling into the evil that that person has fallen fallen into now so if you fear for a people that they may become affected then you then of course you stress this you stress this don't sit with them 
Don't eat with them. Don't talk with them. So on and so forth. Why? Because you fear for the person that you're, that you're speaking to. That by being in close proximity and interacting closely with this individual, it may cause them to become upon what they are upon and be affected by their innovation. However, if it has become clear that these objectives will not be met, meaning that you're in a situation where boycotting them will cause more harm for you. Boycotting them will cause more harm for you or more harm for the situation. Right? Then in that case, you don't do it. Or will cause more harm for that particular person, right? Then in that case, you don't do it. So, for an example, if there's a person who's upon innovation, but they're a person who, yeah, I mean, they have fallen into that error because they have fallen into that error. But a person who, if addressed, you, 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 yeah, I mean, there's some hope and you feel that they may retract, then of course you have to interact with that person to bring these things to their attention, to refute what they are upon, to dialogue and communicate with them. So that you can advise them to leave alone that innovation that they are upon. Now, without that dialogue, without that communication, without that open lines of communication, then you will be incapable of giving this advice. Right. So in that case, boycotting them will cause more harm. Because it's an individual that if you dialogue with them, it's possible they will leave the, the innovation. But if you abandon them and you don't dialogue with them, they're going to go deeper into the innovation because of those who are around them. So in that situation, what? You don't boycott. You sit down with the person, you dialogue with them. You dialogue with them. You know? You call them. You advise them. You have to, you know, in these situations, you have, you know, these are things that this is a and this is a case where boycott is is, is is not is not the course of action. Likewise, if you're in a situation where the people of innovation have strength, like you're in a Muslim country where the people of innovation they have strength. And the mufti from that country, for example, you know, you are a teacher there and so on and so forth. And the mufti from that, from that, from that, from that country, for example, invites you to eat with them. And you know, if you don't go, that's going to be a problem. You might lose your job. You might be, you might get locked up. You know, a lot of things could happen. Then in that situation, does it make sense for you to boycott that person? No, in that situation, you have to what? You have to go and, you know, have tea with the mufti, <laughs> you know? So... It's important that we understand that these things, they're not just black and white like that. They're not black and white. But you have a rule, and then you have the application of that rule. And this is why the like of these affairs, we have to refer them back to the ulama. We have to refer them back to the ulama. If you don't know, refer back to the ulama. Ask those who know if you don't know. So if you don't know, what should be applied in this particular scenario? Then what? Then you consult with the ulama. You ask them. You ask their advice. You explain to them. This is the situation. What's your advice? What's your opinion? What do you think? Based upon kitab and sunnah. Naam. It's not black and white, brothers and sisters. The third point of benefit is that in hafthul muslimin jami'an jami'an على أن يكونوا إخوانا أو إخوة is that this is an encouragement for all of the Muslims to be brothers متحابين متآلفين to be brothers it is an encouragement for the Muslims to be real brothers real brothers loving each other Having love for each other and showing that love, and having unity, connecting, and and and, and uh, having love and affection for each other, and being connected to one another, this is and this is an encouragement, an extreme encouragement for the Muslims to be brothers and treat each other like brothers. the fourth point of benefit, and likewise, the love between the believers, between the Muslims, it necessitates that we introduce good to each other, that we strive to make sure that good reaches each other, and that we repel harm from each other. We strive so that good reaches each other and repel harm from each other. Now, this goes back. I'm a, I'm a, I want to come back now to this issue of boycotting, right? Because um, there are people who boycott in a manner that's not in compliance with the with with the methodology of the salaf, the people who boycott in a manner that's not 
in compliance with the methodology of the seller. In other words, boycotting is not in all cases at every single period of time for every single for everybody. You know what I mean? No, but rather sometimes now nah, we boycott, we stay away and that's it. And then at other times we, where we interact, you have to interact with the individuals to what to call them. Because now the Sheikh, he mentions, he says that from brotherhood is that we uh, bring good to each other and that we repel harm from each other. Okay, repelling harm and bringing good to an individual who is not upon the sunnah. Muslim, well-intending, but they're not upon the sunnah. How are we going to bring them good and repel harm if we don't interact with them? You, you understand? How are we going to bring them good and repel harm if, 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 if we don't interact with them? How are we going to refute and show them the falsehood that they are upon if we don't interact with them? How are we going to draw their attention to that? A person can say, well, I, I, I just write something on the issue. Now, there are going to be some people that are benefit, and that's good. Okay, but what about that scenario where there are individuals who you don't believe they're going to read your writings? Individuals who they don't know about your websites. The individuals who they don't know about your talks or whatever the case is, you know, for the, for the, you know, for the day. Individuals who they, they're not going to hear. They're not, they, they don't follow your lessons. They don't follow you know, uh, your, 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 your sermons. They don't come to your masjid. They don't go to your website. They don't follow you on social media. So how are they going to hear from you? But if there's a situation where they you, know, you, you have an opportunity to go to them and to and to call them, then why wouldn't you go to them and call them? Why wouldn't you go to them and try to educate them? Why wouldn't you go to them and try to show them what is correct? Why wouldn't you go to them and warn them from potential evils that are out there or evils that they are right now have fallen into to try to remove and get them out of that situation? Why wouldn't you do that? Did not Ibn Abbas Did he not go to the Khawarij and debate them? He went. Ali Radiallahu at first he was scared for him. He said, No, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. But then when he explained what he wanted to do, Ali Radiallahu he said, Naam, okay, yes. Go. And he went. And there were many from the Khawarij that left with him. They repented, came back to the Sunnah because they saw, they were shown the evil of their ways because they were upon what they were upon out of ignorance. You see? In any event, things are not black and white. So I, want to, I just want to keep stressing that. The fifth point of benefit, أَنَّهُ يَحْرُمُ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِ لِأَخِيهِ ظُلْمُ وَخِذْلَانُ وَاحْتِقَارُ وَالْكَذِبُ عَلَيْهِ That it is haram for a Muslim This hadith shows us in the clearest of terms It's haram for a Muslim to oppress his brother or sister Muslim Or to betray them, abandon them, to betray them Haram Or to look down on them Or to lie to them all of these things are haram. Naam. Because when one reflects upon all of these things, all of these things will, will result in hatred and enmity between the Muslims. Somebody oppress you, you're not going to like that person. Somebody betray you, leave you hanging, abandon you at your time of need, you're not going to like that person. A person looks down on you and treats you like you're nothing and, you know, and, and the like, you're not going to like that person person disrespecting you and, and looking down on you talking down to you like you're nothing and treating you like you're nothing and so on and so forth you're not going to like that person person lying to you right then caught in their lies how they don't lie to you and so on and so forth you're not going to like or trust that person all these things will undermine the brotherhood so anything that undermines the brotherhood and connection and relationship between the muslims is haram the sixth point of benefit bayan al-khutura al-ihtiqar al-muslim li-akhihi it shows us the danger and you know, how severe looking down upon another Muslim is. How severe it is. And that this is enough. I want you to think about that. Is that looking down on a Muslim 
is so dangerous, is so despicable that it is enough of evil. It is enough of evil that if a person had no other sins, I want you to listen to this. If they had no other sin, they didn't commit any other sin. But they looked down upon a Muslim. That one sin by itself is too much. It's too much sins. Too much. It's too bad. Too evil. By itself is too much. So now think about us. We have a lot of sins, right? We have a lot of sins. So now you add this one sin that by itself is too much to individual who has other sins. That's a bad recipe. That's very bad. Do you understand? So looking down upon other Muslims is so despicable. And in this, it shows us the repugnant nature of racism. It shows us this. And I, and I really want us to understand this. Now I'm, and especially, especially the African-American. I want you to understand this, right? So, of course, what I'm saying, it applies to everybody. But right now, specifically, talking to the black people, talking to the black brothers and sisters, right? Racism is despicable. Do you understand? Does racism exist? Yes, racism exists. Are there some Muslims who are racist? Yes, there are some Muslims who are racist. They shouldn't be, but they are. Okay, but a component of racism is what is looking down on other people. These people, you look down, they're not good enough. Okay, when it comes to certain things, oh no, they ain't good enough. Business, we don't do business with them. Why? What's what's one of the underlying understandings of that? Is that what they're not good enough? We don't do business with them, huh? Can they come and sit at our table and come eat with us? I don't eat with us. We don't eat with the likes of them. Well, that's why. Looking down on them, right? Okay, it comes time for marriage. Maybe one of them, they can, you know, get married, good brother. Nah, we don't marry them. Why? Look down on them. They're less than. You understand? That's a component of racism. Looking down upon others. So I, I'm stressing this because, listen, as a black man, I've been treated racist by many people. Treat me in a bad way because I'm black. Some non-Muslims and some Muslims treated me bad. You understand? Discriminated against me. I wasn't good enough. Looked down on me. So on and so forth. Right? Uh, you know, don't want to invite me places. It's cool. Don't want me come place. I'm not welcome. That's cool. Would never marry anybody in their family to the likes of me based on how I look. That's cool. I cannot now, in turn, respond to their racism with racism. Do you understand? They committed this horrible and ugly and despicable act by looking down on me. That's on them. Yomul Qiyamah, that's on them. If they infringed upon my rights in any which way, shape, and form, on the day of judgment, I'm going to get my right back. They're going to be in trouble. You with me? That's if what? If I do what is correct. See, the fact that someone else doesn't do what is right doesn't give you license now to be wrong too. No. They didn't do what's right. They violate it. They're in trouble. That's on them. If you do the same things and you violate, then you're going to be in trouble as well. You're also going to be in trouble and subject to trouble, being in trouble. You understand? We have to remember that. Just because people treat us in a bad way don't mean we, we retaliate back in a bad way. Although, the reality is, is that they have pushed us out and pushed us together. Okay. But now does that mean because it's like that? Okay, if I'm not welcome, all right, then y'all ain't welcome. Nah. Nah, we don't worry like that. Why? Because at the end of the day, we belong to Allah. 
And on the day of judgment, we want to benefit. On the day of judgment, we want to benefit. And I want everybody to understand this. On the day of judgment, we want to benefit. And if, if benefiting means that I got to be patient with your harms, so now on the day of judgment, I'm going to benefit from your good deeds, or you gonna, or I'm going to benefit because you're going to take my bad deeds, then that's going to be our transaction then. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to benefit when I meet my Lord. I'm trying to go to Jannah. I'm not trying to allow your foolishness to get me in trouble. I'm not trying to allow your foolishness now to put me in the position where you may take my good deeds. I'm not going to allow your foolishness and your stupidity to get me in trouble with the Lord who created both of us. I'm not doing that. If that's how you want to be, that's on you. If you took something from me, I'll get it back. No problem. You can hold that. I'll take it back when it really counts. But I'm not going to put myself in a situation now because you're so stupid that you put your own self in a situation. I'm not going to put myself in that same situation. That's what we have to keep remembering. And I'm and I'm stressing to African Americans because what? Because it's hard. It's hard, man. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, act like, oh, it's easy. You understand? That um these things come no problem. I don't feel I don't feel hurt by it. No, you're going to be hurt. It's going to hurt your feelings. You're going to feel disrespected because it's disrespectful. But you have to govern the way that you respond, thinking about the bigger picture. Okay, it's like that. No problem. Hold that. Their judgment. Run it back. That's how we have to keep remembering that. We have to keep remembering that. Don't allow their mistreatment to make you hate them in a manner that is not, that's beyond bounds. Do you, you, you understand? It's very 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 important that we stress this because this is this is a fight this is a fight it's sad to say it and it shouldn't be like that but that's the way it is it's a fight so we have to fight ourselves to keep doing what is right despite other people doing what's wrong and that's that's just the bottom line you know so that's 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 uh that, that's that's what i want to say to every black person here in my voice and everybody else who's put in a situation where they have to you know, these these words are um what do you call it these words have relevance to them then these words are for you as well and for everybody else i mean you have to do what's right stop 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 being like this because you, you you're just hurting yourself at the end of the day you're just hurting yourself the, the, the seventh point is an end mizan for tafadul oh look at this you see how it's all connected Subhanallah. People looking down on people and all this type of stuff, right? Looking down for what? Because I'm not as light as you. Or we flip it. People look down on people because you're not as dark as us. You understand? That that makes you better. Your skin complexion makes you better. Your tone makes you better. Hmm? You can you can pass the brown paper bag a test that makes you better than somebody who can't pass it. Right? Um no, not at all. You see the beauty of the deen, the holistic uh, uh, teaching here. After we don't, after yani, the sheikh he mentioned what, how you don't look down on people. This is not, this is not the way, right? You know, you don't look down on the Muslims because looking down means you think you better. You know, you don't look down on somebody except that you're from a place that's higher. You think you better. You're looking down. I'm better than you. You ain't. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. What makes you better? وأن الميزان في التفاضل بين الناس التقوى that that which will make people better amongst يعني make people better than other people is what is تقوى is their obedience and fear of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the more obedient they are to Allah the more they stay away from يعني sins and disobedience unto Allah that makes them better that's who's better not because you was born in this place, or you speak this language, or you look like this, or you this height, or this your tribe, and you, you know. Not because your forefathers was this and that. No, no, no. None of that. What makes you better or makes somebody else better than someone is what is how much they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the true metric. That's the true measuring stick. The one who is more obedient to Allah, that's the one who is better. Now, I want you to reflect on this, though. 
that's a that's 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 a measuring stick or a metric that none of us can accurately gauge. We can't gauge that. I can't look at you and say how much tukwa you have. You can't look at me and say how much tukwa I have. I don't know what's in your heart. You don't know what's in my heart. I don't know what's in your heart. You don't know what's in my heart. I don't know all the deeds you do. You don't know all the deeds I do. I don't know the sins you stay away from. You don't know the sins I stay away from. Likewise, I don't know the sins. There's some sins you do I don't know about. There's some sins I do you don't know about. We have to understand who we are. We're flawed people. We're flawed. We're not going to know who really had the taqwa real for real until when the day of judgment. This is why Ahlul Sunnah, we don't say nobody's guaranteed Jannah except for those who there comes a text say they guarantee Jannah. Naam. So the Sahaba, Naam, we know they got the Jannah. Allah Ta'ala said, Radi Allahu anhum wa radu an. Allah's pleased with them, they please with him. We know this. Naam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah. That, that Abu Bakr is in Jannah, Umar is in Jannah, Uthman is in Jannah, Ali is in Jannah. We know this. The hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told Bilal that he heard his footsteps in, in, in the Jannah. So we know Bilal is in Jannah. We know this. We have a text. Naam. But anybody else who there's no text for, we don't guarantee anything. Because at the end of the day, Allah knows best. We don't know. So if this is the case as relates to great scholars, to great imams, how do we interact with ourselves like we know where we're going? We don't know where we're going. We hope and we fear. We hope Allah accepts from us our good deeds and we fear that he won't accept them. We hope Allah forgives us. We fear we have done something that he's not going to forgive us. We fear meeting Allah with shirk. Because Allah says he don't forgive shirk. We fear falling into polytheism. We fear falling into that which is not correct. And we hope we do what's right. So we between hope and fear. We, we hope to go to Jannah. And we fear we may have to go to hell. None of us has a guarantee. Because none of us can what? We can't gauge our taqwa. We don't know. There's certain indications. Now, a person's obedient, stay away from sin. This is a good sign. But to now to really gauge, Allahu A'lam. Because, I, and, 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 and I'll put it like this. Is it possible that a person on the outside, apparently, I'm on the outside, we're talking outside right now. They do good and they stay away from evil. But what motivates them in doing that is to have others have a good opinion of them or to have others speak well of them, so on and so forth. In other words, they're doing these things to show off. Is that possible? That a person could apparently be righteous, but in reality, they're just showing off? That's possible. So what I'm saying is that we have indications. Yes, doing good and staying from evil is an indication. But you have to always question, go back now and say, well, what's my motivation? Is this sincerely for Allah or is there something else going on? Is this purely for Allah or are there some other underlying motivating factors that are you know, leading to this and that? This is why the self, they will always will question themselves and they will question their intentions and they will always purify their intentions and keep the look of a constant purification of the intention. Do you understand? So, like I'm saying again, these are indications. But again, we're not going to know how well we did or didn't do until the day of judgment. That's the reality. So there is no guarantee. It's not like the battery indi indicator on our phone. We can say how full it is or, you know, how low and so on and so on. We don't know. Some of us now could be in the red. Even though our mind got us thinking that we fully charged. Some of us now could be in low power mode. Even though in our mind we think we're, we're operating at optimal capacity. Nah, but we don't know. This is why you have to be humble. This is why 
it don't make sense for you to look down upon nobody. Don't look down upon no Muslim. Really, don't look down because the race is not over yet. And you don't know how you're going to finish. You don't know how they're going to finish. So don't look down upon any one period. But concentrate on making yourself better so that when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your battery's in the green. Allah Ta'ala he says Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum That verily the most noble with you with Allah Then they are the one who fear Allah the most The eighth point is that Taqwa mahalluha al-qalb Is that taqwa its places inside of the heart That's where it lives at It lives inside of the heart Kama fi hadha al-hadith As it comes inside of this hadith Wa kama fi qawlihi ta'ala As it comes in Allah Ta'ala statement Thalika Wa man yu'adhim شعائر الله فإنها من تقوى القلوب and Allah Ta'ala statement and, 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 uh, and like this and verily the one who they honor the symbols of Allah then verily that is from the the taqwa of the hearts that is from the taqwa of the heart of the heart نعم well, of the hearts the شعائر of Allah meaning that these are the signs يعني أعلام الدين الظاهرة that they are the, you know, the, the, the signs and the hallmarks of the deen. So, as, and this is a very important point. That this is, that the taqwa lives inside of the heart. But the one who they honor the signs and those, those hallmarks of the deen. Then this is from, this results from the taqwa that came from the heart. So, the signs of the deen are those things that Islam is known by. Right? Those things that Islam is known by. Those apparent things that Islam is known by. These are the symbols of Allah. This is what is meant by the symbols of Allah. And the one who honors them. Then this is a sign. This is from the tuckle of the hearts. So when you honor them, that's what that's outwardly, right? But the the the, the source of where it's emanated from was where it was from the heart. The tuckle that's where inside of the heart. So this is why, yeah, I mean, we, we don't know whose level is what. We don't know, you know, whose battery is full and whose battery is not. We we we, we don't whose tuckle, you know, battery is full, tuckle battery is, is not. We, we don't know. We don't know. Allah knows. We we don't know. Allah knows us. We don't know. The ninth point, which was and indicated uh, by what was aforementioned, is that what? And the taqwa fil qurub, that the taqwa in the hearts, tadhharu atharuha ala al jawarih, that the taqwa that's inside of the hearts, then it becomes manifest upon the limbs. Wa bi surah al qurub, yaslahu baqiyatu al jasad, and by the rectification of the hearts, the rest of the body will become rectified. And the tenth and final, and this is important to know too, that taqwa, yes, there's a internal, external. It is there internally, and then you have to act externally, yani, upon what is correct and stay away from that which is wrong. So, it, you know, they go together, as aforementioned. The ninth, uh, excuse me, the tenth and final point, تَحْرِيمُ الْإِعْتِدَى عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي دَمَائِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَعْرَاضِهِمْ And that is the prohibition of infringing upon the rights of the Muslims as relates to their lives and physical well-being, as relates to their wealth and property and money, and as relates to their honor and reputations and the like. It is haram to infringe upon these things. And then the Shaykh gets into the next hadith. Uh, but inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll stop at this point. فنكتفي بهذا القدر وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وجزاكم الله خيرات.